Thank you, everybody, for, for those of you who are able to join. I know there is a lot going on right now, um, and all of us are uh, pretty stretched. Um, uh, we wanted to bring in something uh, for everybody uh, related to this recent climate disaster and how it intersects with um, our utility, particularly CPS Energy, the energy utility that failed in uh, providing electricity and gas. Uh, there's a lot of overlap uh, with water as well. That energy and uh, water nexus is for real. Um, I do want to just introduce a couple of concepts because we are recording and this hopefully will be going out broadly into the community. Uh, many folks on this call may already be fairly familiar, uh, but what we mean when we talk about CPS energy, um, let me swap out. Um, we're talking about a service territory um, that covers not just Bear County, right? So uh, it's it, CPS is uh, the the largest municipally owned. That means owned by the residents of San Antonio. Um, energy utility with providing both natural gas and electricity. There's about 850 customers um, owners. Uh, that get their electricity from CPS and about 350 for gas. Um, and uh, again, this is a, it's a big city, a big county, uh, but then we're also seeing the service territory go into to other areas. You'll notice that uh, up into Comal County, up into Medina, Medina County, uh, and in, in, in not so much, but in Atascosa County. Um, and if you were in this area, uh, it's very likely that you experienced outages. Uh, I think up to 400, almost 400,000 people were left without power uh, during this winter storm that came through. Um, and that's left people with a lot of questions um, and uh, natural gas prices sp spiked during this period. So there's a lot of people wondering also uh, if they have their energy turned back on what they're gonna end up owing. And there's a big question mark on that. Um, so in, related to, to CPS though, I'll just go real quickly through this. Um, uh, we get our energy here from a variety of sources. Uh, we've been involved into this point, uh, a, a, a slow move right further into renewable energy and storage options. Um, historically, uh, this was in the, like in the fifties, this was a big gas uh, utility. Uh, they ex expanded into coal, they expanded into nuclear uh, and into wind and to a lesser degree into solar. Um, and it's important to know that, that all, all of these sources uh, failed to one degree or another. Wind, not nearly to the level that it's been made out to in the, the media. There were some wind farms that, that froze, uh, but the big sources that we rely on in this time of year uh, are the base loads and, and, and gas. Gas was the big one. Uh, so our gas, uh, there were frozen wellheads uh, and uh, one of the coal plants went down. Uh, originally they, they said it was because of one thing, but, but now we think it was because they were unable to physically get the coal to the plant. Uh, one of the nuclear plants failed uh, in that weather. So the collapse here was, was kind of across the board as it has been across the ERCOT spectrum. Um, and uh, we obviously, we were, you know, in this in this in this huge moment um, with, um, with 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 COVID continuing, we're we're now seeing you know the, the potential of this uh, uh, of this winter storm driving people inside into shelters uh, as another super spreader event. We're seeing variants of COVID nineteen uh, crop up, and uh, we're 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 far from done uh, there. And we know when 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 COVID hit, there was a huge economic, a public health crisis, and an economic crisis. Uh, that uh, communities uh, across San Antonio have been working to address. Um, and, and, and I think probably two things now that, that that's been compounded uh, by, by this storm, uh, we also want to talk about uh, climate. So anywhere to, to start a conversation about utility, debt, disconnections, these, these, these issues, these are the things that CPS can respond to. The, the big rolling blackouts across the state is, is kind of ERCOT territory and utilities elsewhere. But when ERCOT came to San Antonio uh, and asked for, you know, 7% of the state load, they asked for, you know, our energy to, to, to be drawn down. How that was done is all about CPS. 
right? So the, the, the outages were about our utility, uh, the blackouts, the way they were managed were about our utility, um, our rates and our debt and uh, the accum accumulation of that debt from COVID on, uh, we've been able to keep disconnections from happening and that's at a, at a local state and at a federal level for those reasons. Um, but there's a community organizations here that adopted uh, in October and issued an open letter uh, with five demands. And the very first one had to do with disconnections. Uh, and to, to, to this moment, uh, we haven't had uh, disconnections come into force. What we have is uh, residents coming in or, or kind of being coerced and drawn into payment plans. Uh, and if you come into a payment plan arrangement uh, that they'll, they'll, they'll leave your energy on or, you know, um, but that debt accumulates and that debt accrues. And we know that uh, along with that, when, when you do end up uh, going onto a payment plan, you end up, you're paying two bills at once, you know, uh, and it becomes really unwieldy and unmanageable for a large part of our community. Uh, we had other demands that went into that letter in terms of uh, making conservation, which is now critical in response to this storm, being left out entirely with the concept uh, of the conversation. Conservation could be a tool, weatherization of communities and homes. There could be a green core across the city, improving uh, uh, people's homes, improving their lives, keeping their bills down. There's a lot of opportunity there that hasn't been addressed at all. And I will say to this open letter, we got zero response from the mayor, from the council or the board of trustees at CPS Energy later, much later, almost a year after this, this, this letter came out, um, uh, uh, well, after the initial report uh, on efficiency came out, that we be began to engage with CPS. So you can see some of these main points that were, uh, uh, were brought forward currently, and for the purposes of this call, we want to look at ex expanding number one. So we know that the burden that's placed on people is not just about whether the power is on or whether the power is off. Um, it's about the rates um, and fair rates. It's about um, the debt that people are accruing and debt forgiveness. It's about how our housing, you know, we know housing, not all housing is created equally. And even if all of us, even if the entire city went black, uh, we know that people in better homes and more weatherized and efficient homes don't suffer in the same way as people who are in homes that, you know, just breathe, you know, that there is no insulation or very little or, you know, gaps around the windows and all that kind of thing. So that's something to be mindful of. And then uh, just energy justice in general. Um, one thing that, that we created and I wanna put up there for folks to, to, um, to participate uh, is this, um, uh, allow everybody, is this poll. Can folks, are folks able to, to see this? Okay. I'm sorry, Letty, that I was speaking faster than I intended to. I guess raise your hand if you're able to see the poll. Okay, people are voting, good. So this is where we wanna know kind of where people are. People are coming from different places um, and different interest levels and different needs. Um, if you're primarily interested in, you know, programs, how the city, how CPS, how we can help one another weatherize and, and better uh, 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 protect protect ourselves and our neighbors in, in, in our home, in our homes. That's kind of like the first one, utility debt and debt forgiveness. Um, if folks are voting in there, um, that's, you know, uh, we've talked about the accruing debt um, and, and how we're gonna deal with that. Right now we know that, uh, we don't know the number I think, um, but natural gas prices went sky high and, and we were buying, we were on the market buying that gas. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of ways we can address this. I see five, three, two, almost everybody's voted. Good. Thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to be turning over in a second, the, this presentation to Tim Barr. I think that's everybody, but me has voted. Uh, and good. So I'll put out the results. Uh, now, Tim, uh, the, 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 we've created this as, uh, as a response to this winter storm, uh, to this climate crisis, uh, and, and now on the back of built upon that, the suffering and, and built upon the back of the, the pandemic. 
Uh, and so we really want to explore ways we can respond to that for policies that we can develop, that we can push uh, at the Board of Trustees at CPS, but, but probably at this point even better before the mayor and the council to make sure that as these investigations into what went wrong, these investigations into why people were left in the cold, um, like I said earlier, almost 400,000 people lost power for you know a day, two days, three days even. Um, and we know that the deaths, we don't know how many, but we know we're still finding, going to be finding people in their homes, unfortunately, um, tragically for a while yet. Uh, and we know that all of this intersects with uh, the, the history, the patterns of development of San Antonio. Uh, with environmental racism, where the, the the largest among the large cities in the United States, the most economically, the most racially segregated of cities, uh, development patterns have done uh, have have moved to specifically um, uh, reflect the needs of, uh, for the most part, Anglo residents, high income residents, and that's why development has gone kind of fanned to the north and not to the south. And when we look at utility burden, and, and this is a conversation will evolve. Uh, but I was looking at a map the other day of utility burden, meaning like how much people, how much of our income, people's one's income uh, goes to paying for water and power. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was like 3% up here in that fan. And there was one zip code in the south that was just dark, dark purple. Uh, it was, and I don't know the zip code right now, but it was like uh, a quarter um, uh, one of every four dollars that go into that house go out again to these two utilities that are owned by the San Antonio. Um, but I do want to introduce so so Tim is kind of he's in the excuse me public health uh, field. Uh, he's been researching these issues for the past several months um, and uh, has brought some really interesting findings. I think primarily to spark conversation, uh, to to look at what do other cities, other communities, other states, are they, uh, what are they doing. Uh, in the realms of, of energy justice. So I think at, at that, I can, I can turn it over. And Tim, thank you for being with us and everybody who's able to join. Uh, again, this is being recorded and will be shared in both Spanish and we'll have an English version as well. If you need Spanish translation on the bottom of your screen, um, uh, you'll see a, a translation icon. Uh, thank you, Tim, I'm gonna let you uh, go from here. Thank you, Greg, for that introduction. I'm really grateful to be here with you. And I know you have other options for what you do on a Sunday afternoon. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'm excited about this conversation. I am certainly uh, not going to claim you know, special expertise, uh, but I've been learning on this and just want to frame the conversation and offer a lot of ideas uh, that I've found in looking at academic research and also models from other cities. Um, to, to support a deeper analysis and a deeper conversation on a local level. So I've got a number of slides that I'm going to offer to, to help us kind of develop some shared language, perhaps, or at least have some starting points for the conversation. And then we'll definitely move into questions and answers and, and deeper discussion. And I'm excited that um, most of you, more than half of you, wanted to talk about energy justice and energy democracy. We can definitely um, build out that part of our analysis as we as as we move forward. So, you know, just to start, um, I think it's important. I, I recognize a lot of the the names that um, have have shown up today for this webinar, um, and, and so I think most of you are already familiar with CPS Energy. But you know, just to to return to the origins, um, that name st originally stood for City Public Service. Um, our this is a munis municipally owned uh, energy utility, and yet it functions more like a corporate energy utility, where it's focused primarily on revenue. On um, and and it's not really doesn't doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of energy democracy here as decisions are made, and so that's part of the reason for having this conversation. Um, to, to not only examine uh, the power generation sources like wind and solar, but also to look at shutoffs and utility debt. So I want to begin just by acknowledging that we're on the ancestral homelands of the Kwawatekan people. And, and just to, to name that as, as a starting point for our conversation to, to honor and recognize the original stewards of these lands, um, and to, to recognize that um, me personally, I, I am a, a trespasser or a visitor here in this place. Um, to recognize that history, the legacy it has created, 
Um, and yet to also um, to, to name and, and celebrate the perseverance and the thriving of indigenous peoples, uh, not only here in this place, but uh, across these lands. So I just invite you to, to join me for a few moments of silence to remember our relationship to this land and to its original stewards and ongoing stewards. So sometimes when we talk about disasters, we take a very narrow uh, focus on, for example, the, the polar vortex and the fact that people lost power and, and what that was like. But we also need to remember always that there were disasters before the disaster. Um, and, and that when we have systems level problems, we have to look at systems level solutions. So it's not enough as, as we've seen in the last week, just to create more charitable support for utility assistance or to fix broken pipes, we need a deeper analysis of what went wrong, what's been going wrong throughout our COVID response, and even what's been broken in our economic stru structures long before any of these crises of the last you know, two weeks or even of the last year. So we need to talk about racism. We need to talk about white supremacy. We need to talk about historical trauma and how that keeps getting passed from one generation to the next. Disasters present opportunities to reimagine how things work and to demand change. It's, it's especially at a policy level, that's the opportunity. And so that's part of the reason we're gonna talk about, uh, I know nobody indicated that they wanted to talk about debt, but that is a very specific policy, uh, just like disconnections that allow us to, to really give some teeth to our analysis of what's happening. So it's, it's too simplistic, it's actually, I would say wrong for us to say that people without resources just need to learn more resilience. I love this quote uh, in the middle top of the screen. We know that people who are materially poor have no choice but to be resilient. It's, it's how survival happens. So we need to examine the conflicting choices that people must make between housing, medical needs, utility bills. One sudden setback, setback can lead to a negative spiral. So in other words, we can't just look at this disaster of two weeks ago, we also have to see the, policies, the policy disasters that preceded it and made it that much worse. So um, just one of the helpful concepts that I appreciate is the notion of a resilience reserve, uh, which is the idea that people living in a state of chronic hardship, they, they have already been pulling on that reserve, but they have their own sense of resilience that they're drawing from throughout any disaster, including uh, winter storm Yuri. So here's where we're at. Due to COVID, CPS has placed a moratorium on utility disconnections. And after last week's polar vortex, uh, Governor Abbott directed the State Public Utilities Commission to create a temporary moratorium on shutoffs due to non-payment resulting from uh, that disaster. On a federal level, we know that there's $1.9 trillion of a stimulus package that's moving through Congress. Um, and it includes support for low-income families facing utility debt, but that's uh, it's, it's, it's part of a much larger package, and those dollars that have been um, earmarked are also supposed to also go for housing assistance. So it's not exactly clear what amount of money is going to be available specifically uh, for utility support, um, both you know, in terms of uh, people trying to pay their bills now and, and, and debt that's accumulated over the, over the last year or longer. So what we do know is that there are $19.1 billion to provide rental assistance to state and local governments and help with utility bills. And then there's also another $10 billion to assist homeowners. Um, but that's, again, at the larger level, not just utility uh, bills, but it's also mortgage bills, property taxes, and those kinds of things. So even with these federal stimulus dollars, if they were enough, which I doubt they will be based on some of these headlines and things that I've been reading, even if those were enough dollars to, to cover the amount of utility debt that has been created, the other question that we need to ask ourselves is, is household energy a basic human right? In other words, should our elders, should our families with children, should people with medical conditions, should they have their utilities disconnected because they can't pay? Particularly in the coldest, or as we more frequently have here, in the hottest parts of the year even if we aren't experiencing a pandemic, should that ever be the case? And I would say from a perspective of, of energy justice, 
uh, no is, 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 is the answer that, that we probably would all agree on. So when we're talking about household energy and the fact that some people's basic energy needs are not being met, we're talking about the concept of energy insecurity. And it's related to food insecurity, which is more commonly known, which is where you don't have enough food, the ability to pay for food. Um, and it's also related to housing insecurity, which is about housing instability. And a lot of times that trifecta of insecurities um, are, are kind of acknowledged for their relationships uh, between each other. They're part of that broader economic system and what's broken. Now, roughly the same number of US households experience food insecurity as energy insecurity, and many experience both, but there's a, a very different public perception uh, for food insecurity compared to energy insecurity. So as you can see on the screen, um, one of the, the, the tools that has been developed to assess energy insecurity it involves these three, um, three steps. You're energy secure if you have no problems. You're moderately energy insecure if you've had a threat from your utility to disconnect within the last 12 months. And you're considered to be severely energy insecure if you've either had a shutoff or you've had one or more days without heat or cooling or you've heated your home with a cooking stove. The other key thing that I wanna emphasize, you know, in terms of energy insecurity is, is recognizing that it's not just economic. Sometimes it gets sidelined into only thinking about energy burden relative to income. That's certainly an important part, but we also have to look at physical structures, housing structures and their relationship to energy insecurity, as well as the coping strategies that people use that lead to negative health outcomes. And we're gonna turn next to those health outcomes. So this is a graphic from a utility reform network called TURN in California. And I love how they've pulled together these different pieces of health impact as it relates to energy insecurity. So broadly speaking, we know that energy insecurity, um, some of those health outcomes include increased stress, mental health challenges, impaired sleep, heat stress, and cardiovascular and respiratory issues. We also know that low resource or low income groups experience daily chronic stress. And, and that's also true for, for um, racial groups, um, racially oppressed, marginalized groups, um, also experience greater daily chronic stress, which impacts their ability to respond to the stress that results from a disaster like winter storm Uri. And that process of continual depletion is, is part of what I was talking about earlier with those resilience reserves. It's, it's, it's withdrawing more and more from an account that's already being depleted, which makes it harder for some families and some individuals to bounce back from an event like Winter Storm Uri. We also know um, from, from public health literature, from medical literature, that chronic stress increases susceptibility to adverse health effects. Specifically for children living in poverty, this can impact brain development, and increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, asthma, and depression later in life. One of the terms that you often hear as people talk about energy insecurity is the heat or eat dilemma. And uh, that certainly makes sense in more Northern climates and it made sense two weeks ago. I wonder though, in the summer um, for us, if maybe it's air conditioned or malnutrition, I don't, I don't know what the right uh, rhyming uh, phrase is there, but, but just getting at those trade-offs that people have to make between meeting their basic household energy needs and other needs, whether that's food, housing, or other basic expenses. The other thing that we know from the research is that our elders and lower income people are more likely to sweat it out or die during a heat wave because they can't cool their homes. Uh, that's, that's been documented uh, in Chicago and a variety of other places. And so that's just a reality that we know uh, that, that needs to impact the way we communicate and also the policies that we develop. So as we think about energy insecurity, we have to differentiate between what happened for pretty much everyone in Texas last week, which is acute energy insecurity. So if you look on the bottom of this chart, the bottom left side, you'll see short-term acute energy insecurity. It's slightly blue, but that doesn't really come out very well on your screen. So many of us, most of us, almost everybody in Texas experienced short-term 
acute energy insecurity last week. That can happen when there's some kind of disaster, when there's a, a gas leak, um, and it's temporary. And while it has impact, it's certainly not the same as when it happens over and over, which is what is termed chronic energy insecurity, those long-term challenges to affording and accessing essential energy needs. So what we know about climate change is that while it will lead to acute energy insecurity for everyone, um, severe, you know, the, the increase of extreme weather events like what we had two weeks ago, that, that will continue to happen. We also know that whether it's acute or chronic, but especially if it's chronic, it will disproportionately affect people um, who, who have fewer resources, who are at lower income levels. Um, and, and environmental racism also tells us it's gonna primarily impact people of color, or it's gonna impact in a, in a heavier way. Um, and and to, what, to reinforce what I mentioned on the last slide, the other thing is, is just to, to talk about chronic stress, um, which can be transferred from one generation to the next and impacts health, quality of life, and life expectancy through chronic conditions such as accelerated aging, higher rates of disabilities, um, you know, a variety of uh, autoimmune disorders, all of that is impacted through chronic energy insecurity. So data from 2015 that came out uh, two years ago tells us that across the nation, 40% of low-income households were forced to make a choice to pay their energy bill versus purchasing basic needs like food or medicine for their family. Now, this is 40% uh, for low-income households, 16% for middle-income households, and 3% for high-income households, just to kind of provide a scale of difference there. We also know that 13% of lower-income households had to do this every single month, make those trade-off choices between um, basic needs and paying for their energy bill. We also know across the nation that the average household spends 3.1% on their energy bill. But a lower income household typically spends three times as much. Here in San Antonio, that difference is two and a half times. Also, if you look at energy consumption per square foot of your home, the highest consumption is in the lowest and highest income brackets. And this can be explained for higher incomes based on consumption patterns, um, not only electronics, but also the, the uh, temperature points that um, higher income households choose. While for lowest income brackets, this, uh, this larger level of energy consumption per square foot is very clearly linked to inefficient structures, whether that's inadequate insulation or it's the kind of heating and cooling system that's being used in the house, or it's just the types of appliances that either the, the homeowner is uh, able to afford or that the landlord has provided within that dwelling. So moving into the topic that many of you indicated you were um, wanting to talk more about, and, and I'm going to begin with some, you know, this is a framing and then I'll move into some specific policy thoughts moving forward after this slide. When it comes to energy insecurity, there's no bigger expert than Diana Hernandez. And she identifies these four fundamental rights that you see at the top of this slide. So the right to a healthy, sustainable energy production, which speaks you know, in part to what, how is our power being generated? How are we using wind and solar and other renewable sources? Uh, how, are we, how are we providing uh, storage for those renewable sources? A second right to the best available energy infrastructure, which clearly failed us all in this last you know, two weeks. But, she identifies that as a basic right. A third right is around affordable energy, which gets into rates. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to rates in, in a couple slides. And then finally, making energy, you know, this right to uninter un uninterrupted energy service is really about making energy a basic human right, regardless of one's ability to pay. Other experts in this field, point to a framework that includes um, the, 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 the text in the middle, um, looking at recognition that there's a problem, acknowledging the vulnerab vulnerabilities of different populations, um, procedural justice, so thinking about who's involved in decision-making and, um, and the fairness of the decisions that are being made, distributional justice, 
So examining both the benefits and the burdens to ensure equity and restorative justice, which is primarily about righting past wrongs. And, and an example of this could be through um, housing quality and energy efficiency work. Um, a lot of the literature lifts up energy efficiency as, as a way to build, it's a restorative justice approach to energy insecurity. It increases the value of the home, um, which increases the wealth of the family living in it. It creates jobs, it reduces stress, and it improves the health of the people living in that home. So my remaining slides, like I said, are gonna focus more on policy implications and ideas. Um, one thing to remember though, as, as we kind of move forward, and, and as we think about the inequities and racism in our systems that provide household energy, just remember that utilities in the US invested $8 billion in energy efficiency programs in 2015, but only 9% went toward programs serving lower income households, which is approximately 23% of the population. So it's very disproportionate. I don't know what that percentage is for CPS, but just quickly looking at the data from the STEP program, it looks like there's a similar disparity here locally where we are not, um, we are not investing in energy efficiency to the degree that we should if we're gonna be proportional with the population and the income brackets of our population. So now I'm gonna shift uh, into uh, talking a little bit about efficiency and rates before we go deeper into utility debt forgiveness. Um, this text that you see on this slide is pulled directly from the Natural Resources Defense Council. I don't know if Eloisa uh, was able to join us, uh, but you know, talking about how energy efficiency is one of the most, if not the most powerful weapon that we have to combat climate change, boost the economy, and ensure that we have safe air to breathe. Um, one of the things that Greg pointed out recently, and I completely agree with him, um, you know, CPS Energy is talking about energy efficiency as its fifth fuel. But why isn't it talking about it as its first fuel? Um, and clearly groups like the NRDC would agree that that is a major place, a starting point for this conversation around energy democracy, uh, energy justice, and, and thinking about how every home can be as efficient as possible. Think about the difference that would have made two weeks ago if, if every home had the type of insulation and, um, and infrastructure it needed to, to keep people safer inside of that, to prevent broken pipes, um, to prevent, um, you know, when the power did go out, um, the health um, concerns that emerged out of that. So just a quick mention of um, rate design. Um, you know, CPS has said that they want, you know, they're creating a rate advisory committee and, and those, um, you know, it's, it, if you have not applied for that and have interest in that, please do. Um, they're seeking applicants for that. I wanna bring in a few principles, basic concepts on that topic. Um, this is from the National Consumer Law Center. Um, you know, first of all, that when we think about rate design, it should really be inclining so that higher usage rates, you know, mean that you get charged a higher level. But that is not, it's not just that simple, um, but that it's also, you know, it needs to incorporate the notion of, um, you know, how we build energy efficiency, like this last slide, which is talking about particularly for low income households. Um, it needs to incorporate affordable payments and debt management uh, for low income households, which we'll move to next. And there need to be effective consumer protections to shield, um, customers from losing vital home energy services, basically their heating and cooling. So I'm now gonna move into talking about utility debt and debt forgiveness by looking at some policies from other metro areas. Um, as a quick point of comparison, as I've tried to understand what CPS offers, I see a lot of charitable programs, like a bunch of them, but uh, none of them really go deep into the root causes or kind of expand beyond just immediate short-term responses uh, to people who are in a crisis. Uh, they don't seem to address the bigger, uh, the, the bigger concerns that are at play uh, that these other communities are trying to address in their programs and responses. 
So this first one is a very basic policy. It is uh, very much a stopgap measure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, portray it as anything more than that, but it speaks um, and focuses specifically on uh, COVID-19. And so this is from Louisville. This was announced uh, just within the last month. Um, they're offering um, a one-time debt relief credit up to $500. Um, to be eligible, one needs to have an outstanding balance uh, sometime between March and December of last year. They're not pushing for any income restrictions, but to apply, you have to provide some kind of income documentation and claim a hardship related to COVID. And they're funding this uh, through municipal funds that they freed up uh, using Federal CARES Act funding. So going deeper, um, here's a basic arrearage or debt management structure that seems to be gaining popularity in a variety of locations. Um, and, and it's the same model in these two different basic models, same basic model in these two different locations. Um, so more recently, California, um, has created this arrearage management plan at a state level and required their investor owned utilities um, to incorporate this as part of the, um, the programs that they offer to their customers. Um, basically, if, you, if a customer has accumulated a utility debt up to $8,000, it will be forgiven as long as the customer while in the program makes an on-time monthly payment for 12 consecutive months. So as long as they stay current on their bills, um, then that, that debt up to $8,000 can be forgiven. In order to be eligible, um, a customer has to have already been enrolled in a subsidized, subsidized utility rate program for low-income people. They need to owe at least $500 and they need to be 90 or more days overdue. Now in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, there's a very similar program um, offered by a, a Fortune 500 energy company called Eversource. And their version, instead of limiting that ceiling at $8,000, it's actually at 20,000 per year that will be forgiven of utility debt if a person makes an on-time bill payment uh, on a monthly basis. And in order to qualify, um, the customer needs to be at 60% or less of the state median income or have some kind of medical certification. Um, they have to have a past due balance of $100 or more, and they have to be 60 or more days overdue. So these next two are actually pulling from uh, the field of uh, water billing, but I think that they are probably applicable also to energy billing. Uh, I think the basic structure is something that we should consider. Um, so in Chicago, um, this was started in the last few years. Um, the utility billing relief program um, has, has really kind of changed the way that Chicago is dealing, dealing with water bills and people who fall behind and fall into debt. So for, for this program, the eligibility is 200% um, of poverty, have to be at or below that. Um, while you're in the program, a customer has a 50% reduction in their bill and no disconnections, um, which is a common thing across, across these different programs, including the, the last slide in California, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire as well. And like what you saw on that last slide, if the customer continues to make on-time payments for 12 months, then their past debt is eliminated. Um, one of the things that you'll see as you look at these programs and utilities talking about why they're doing this is that it's actually a net gain um, for the utility. By their calculus, as you can see from this quote from the city comptroller, in, in many cases, um, they're actually, by, by having a program where people you know, pay, even if it's a smaller amount than the full amount that they owe, at least that utility or that city or, or whatever the, the entity is, at least they're bringing in some revenue and they're building a stronger relationship with their customers. And so a lot of these utilities talk about how, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's actually better for them fiscally and also in terms of their long-term relationship with their customers um, to, to create these kind of programs. They're not losing money, in other words. Uh, it, it's actually, it's actually um, you know, putting them back into the black financially. 
And then one final uh, example or model um, that I'll share. This one's from Philadelphia. It's a few years old, um, and they've, I think, been kind of tweaking their model. But basically, the tiered assistance program um, is, is essentially a sliding scale model for thinking about utility bills. Again, it's, it's about water bills, but I think the structure probably can also be applied to energy bills. Um, and, and for this program, um, you know, to be eligible, you have to be at, 100, at or below 150% of poverty. Um, you can also qualify through, um, yeah, I was wondering when Greg was gonna realize that he was uh, posing as Cyrus Reed. Uh, good to have you with us, Greg. Um, a, you know, you can also qualify through some kind of a hardship, um, such as losing a job or domestic violence. Um, but basically, they're, they're tiers with fixed rates. Um, and the, um, the payment, rather than being tied to usage, is tied to your income. Um, they, they, they built this into their city budget. Um, so you're or actually into their budgeting for utilities, for water utilities. Um, so they, it was factored into a 10% rate increase uh, that they um, started in 2016 uh, because they anticipated that it was an $18 million overall um, expense. Um, and, and as part of being in this program, a customer um, will have their debt suspended and then it will be forgiven after two years of making on-time payments. So I'm, I'm coming to the end. Um, these are the sources that I've used for this. Um, we can definitely send out uh, these slides if anybody would like to, to look at these more afterward. We, uh, when you registered, we should have captured uh, your contact information. We can email those out. Um, as part of the work that I've been doing, I've been pulling a lot of resources, about 40 at the moment, and it's a growing list of, um, of documents um, you know, some, some, sometimes it's journal articles, uh, sometimes it's uh, links to organizations, but I've, I've pulled them into a Google Doc uh, that we can also share out if you'd like to go deeper into any of these topics. And I just wanna close as we kind of make this shift into Q&A and going deeper into discussion with this image uh, that you can also, it's, it's um, available through movement generation. Uh, they were part, you know, one of the groups that did the work uh, but the Climate Justice Alliance uh, that uh, Southwest Workers Union is a part of um, also has this on their website. I really love the vision that it offers of a, of a transition, a just transition from an extractive economy toward a living economy, um, prioritizing energy democracy, sustainable and renewable power, and also just the ecological well being of all species, big and small. Um, and we know that that change is only going to happen if we change the rules, like you see in the middle, um, and we change the way that power, you know, works, um, both divesting from the power of, of the way things are made right now and also investing in, in our power, um, whether that's on a local level here, reclaiming our ownership of uh, CPS or, or reclaiming our ownership in these larger structures uh, that extend beyond San Antonio. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited as we kind of move into, you know, deeper analysis um, and thinking about local action and organizing. Um, I'm excited to, to see where this conversation goes. Thanks so much for being here. I'm going to stop and uh, turn it back to Greg. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I think you're on present mode. Uh, still there. Hey. Um, yeah, so I just uh, um, really appreciate. I thought that was really clear. Uh, you brought a lot of good information, and I'm hoping that we can uh, build. This is the dialogue that we're hoping to build upon in San Antonio. Uh, there's a couple folks who had uh, questions. They put them in the Q and A. I responded kind of just very uh, kind of like short responses. But uh, if Terrence or Pahara want to bring in. Uh, for, for further conversation. I'm not a Zoom wizard, so uh, I, I, I kind of set this up in a way I think folks don't have, like we don't have you on video, uh, but I can unmute. And so if you put something in the, stat, in the chat, just type stack in there and we'll try to keep track of folks who want to have more conversation. I will say that, that Terrence in the, in the Q&A function was asking about weatherization and energy efficiency as a key strategy to energy justice in San Antonio. 
Uh, it's, it's a big question and it's one that we want to engage with deeply. I think actually the next call, the next program that I, that I want to do uh, would be answering that question and developing a platform and proposed policies uh, to make it so, right? Because there is some engagement uh, with CPS. Uh, there's a program we can talk about, the Safer Tomorrow Energy uh, program. Uh, that just went out for uh, the next 10 years, and I've got a lot to say about that. I'll hold that for the next call or briefly for this one. Uh, and then Pahra was, was asking uh, about hats off to Recall CPS for pushing forward uh, uh, and, and seeking a structural change uh, with the governance of utility. Um, so uh, let's see uh, where, where we are, if there's one new. Um, yeah, let me ask, well, Terrence, did you, Terrence has got uh, their hand up. So uh, Terrence, why don't you come in? I've got your mic hot, I think. Yeah, you can uh, unmute Terrence and ask your question. Okay. Can there you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm, where I'm coming from is energy efficient buildings, in particular, the passive house building standard. And I have some anecdotal evidence from Texas, uh, how they performed vis-a-vis -vis standard homes, if you're interested. But what, what I am convinced of where I think it will eventually go is each city block will have its own microgrid. Mm -hmm. And let's say 30 homes on that house, on that block, each built to the passive house standard and or similar reach code, building reach code and solar and a battery, uh, both of which use direct current, okay? And anything with electronics in it uses direct current. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, the building standard gets you 90% less energy for heating, 50% less energy for cooling. And if you had all direct current in the house, maybe 40% off the plug loads. That's a tremendous drop in energy requirements for an individual house. Then if you think in terms of the city block with its own microgrid, uh, preferably direct current because it simplifies the building of that microgrid, you can aggregate the resources on that city block to provide like electronic, uh, EV charging or provide ancillary services back to the big grid. And of course the microgrid can island in situations like you guys have just gone through. Thanks for letting me share that. Thank you very much. There's a really excellent, I think that's a, a, a big picture uh, where we need to be going. I think I can answer in the short term right now. Uh, one of the things I hope that we can lift up and elevate uh, will be a uh, the creation of resiliency hubs. So we know that like two thirds of the city were considered to be not on what they call uh, critical circuits uh, and lost power. Um, and we know that through testimonies to date, we know our utility CEO uh, has described our grid uh, within Bear County and, and outside, like we saw the map earlier, uh, to have been built kind of patchwork to just just constantly meeting the growth wherever the growth goes because this is Texas and that's where that's how it works uh, currently. Um, but the need to look at this disaster and say, well, what communities were not safe and what communities were actually more uh, at risk than others and where how where are these circuits? We really need to know where these circuits are as well because creating a resiliency center like you described on a microgrid that's a, a, a firmed up or supported by renewable energy, battery backup. There's a lot of things can be rolled into that. That's a great topic. Really, really interesting. I'd love to uh, follow up with you. Uh, we've got your email and uh, Tim or if someone else wants to speak to that. Uh, I wanna uh, make room for that conversation a little bit more uh, before we turn it over to Pahara and uh, then I've got Meredith on stack. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tim? I, I, yeah, I, I was just putting something into the, the comments um, to say that, yes, I, I, I love that thinking. It's not something that I personally um, understand all that well, but I think that is the direction that we need to go. It's, it, we, we also can expect a lot of pushback as we, as we push for these kinds of changes because they, they threaten the way that uh, utilities work right now, not just our own, but, but all others. Um, and so 
Um, that's that's just the reality. But but yes, we need to, to to be thinking exactly about these kinds of different structures for how we uh, generate and distribute power. And and I, and I love uh, well, Pahara, I love I love so much generally, and it's I'm happy to have you here. Um, it's always um, um, really nice to be together. Um, I, I, I want to tee, tee up your question, right? Um, also, and I need to make your hot in your mic. Um, I want to uh, I wanted to say this before Pahara asked, asked her question um, that we are in a moment right now, and 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 what I feel like is uh, a losing moment um, where the the conversation is rushing into you know, uh, what we can expect kind of from state leaders. Uh, we want to harden things. We want to build more fossil fuels. And, 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 and that's, that's the way we're going to handle this. Not like we're going to protect people. And here's, and here are the ways that, that people, we really can do that. Right. And, and not just uh, float this out as, you know, uh, uh, another blank uh, check to the fossil fuel industries, even in San Antonio, I want to just make a note. We just lost uh, probably our biggest ally at the, at the leadership level of CPS, uh, Chris Eukster to another um, energy interest, uh, and Paula Gold Williams. In the same same day, we learned about that announced that uh, they're going to slow their role on renewables, um, which was already you know uh, slow, uh, and uh, instead uh -huh. a, a new gas plant. Or that's her ambition. She's always been staying in the gears uh, of our utility when it comes to uh, a, a positive transformation. So anyway, I just want to let folks know that it's critical that we build up our message and that we push it out there and then we build it together as a community. So uh, Pahara, do you want to come in and, and ask your question? It may not be one for me. It may be for other folks because I know I'm sorry, Letty. <laughs> um, that was, I promised Letty at the top of the call, I'd speak slowly. Um, so I apologize. Um, Pahara, and it may be, a, and again, this may be a question for folks with the recall petition. Uh, is your, are you able to speak, Pahara? I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Greg, can you hear me? Testing, I, testing. I do. I do. I'm sorry. I'm muted. Oh, okay. Okay. No, that's all right. Um, I, I just, I mean, coming through the grueling months of collecting um, petitions, trying to, after 10 or 11 or more years of trying to get the utility companies to tune into what we really need, and being so frustrated with their mistake after big mistake. Um, I, I really see, I guess I want to ask the community, um, do we see that we need to keep pushing on this? Um, we're not just going to roll over and die. I guess that's my basic question. Uh, yeah, and I heard uh, in 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 the Q and A earlier. I think the question was, "What are we going to do? How how can we do this?" And hats off to 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 recall for that work. I mean, I think my others may have will have other answers, but I think um, getting uh, rallying around um, points demands uh, uh, is is a big part of it. Um, there's I will mention, and we'll uh, maybe at the at the bottom of the call. It's uh, three o'clock now. We've got more time to to dis to talk. But I want to make time for for Didi or, or someone to announce, you know, announce uh, another call, which will be tomorrow night after uh, tomorrow afternoon's meeting of the CPS Board of Trustees. So, um, uh, if anybody wants to speak to that broad point, uh, I welcome you in. Otherwise, uh, Meredith McGuire has a question about rate structure, and which we haven't uh, gotten into yet. Okay, Meredith, you should be able to, to speak. I've got your mic on. If you're still here. Okay, I, can you hear me now? I hear you, yes. Good, thank you. Um, so uh, I, my question pertaining to uh, the rate structure is uh, we already know that CPS Energy has a terrible rate structure that is uh, especially hard on residential rate payers uh, and very much to the advantage of the business users that you're using the very most amount of energy. Uh, but I have noticed that several other cities have much more favorable uh, measures in their rate structure. And in particular, there are several things 
that um, the LA Department of Water and Power, um, which is their public utility in Los Angeles, um, have they have several special measures that I really think we have to fight to get here in San Antonio. For example, one of the things that they have is that they noticed which parts of the city in Los Angeles have higher um, summer temperatures or hotter temperatures altogether, and also which places have more natural cooling during the, the heat uh, periods of the year. And so they've got different um, rates, summer rates for those different parts of the city. And I think that that's something that we could do because already we've seen the heat maps for uh, the urban um, heat island effect. And we could Im impose that on the, uh, or, or superimpose that on the uh, pictures of where, uh, where customers are and come up with a set of rates that are much closer to being fair according to how hot that part of the city is. Uh, there was a recent article in the New York Times about that, at, uh, about the whole heat island issue. And that's tied in with racism as well because a lot of the communities that were redlined are also those that don't have uh, much shade uh, many shade trees and so forth. So I feel that we we should push for that kind of of uh, rate structure that has those things built into them, rather than putting people into the position of having to go begging for help with their rates. Yeah. To start out with um, lower uh, rates that require fixed charges, uh, lower minimum. Um, bills for the households that are in a uh, an area where most of the people there are in need. And so I think that we should do more to uh, make CPS energy and SAWS uh, accept those rate structure elements as basics uh, upon which then they can't just say, oh, well, we aren't going to uh, admit you because you are not within our um, um, affordability discount uh, 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 program and so forth. So I, I, my, I'm asking a question, but I'm asking the question mostly to um, Sierra Club and to Public Citizen because I don't see them already thinking about that, uh, or at least it, my efforts to get that included in what we're demanding, uh, I don't think uh, that we should start out by demanding something that is uh, too close to being what CPS and SAWS are doing right now. Um, yeah, thank you, Meredith. I just put in as a note to folks uh, that the Rate Advisory Committee uh, that we got started. I want to just, <laughs> I want to like push a little bit back up on that the the statement that that public citizens Sierra Club aren't doing this work. We got the rack. Um, I'm very very certain. Yes. Um, and in developing language around rate reform, I'd like to turn it over to Tim. I have a lot of ideas, and I think what we want to do, Meredith, uh, generally is uh, I shared earlier. I know pe folks came in maybe a little bit but late. So we have. Uh, our current right um, list of demands from our open letter built uh, with many, many community partners within Climate Action SA uh, were these, you know, um, when it came to no rate increases until rates are fair. These were broad statements and we did. And what we need to do is drill down and have very specific um, uh, uh, prescriptions. But at the same time, we're, we're in a situation where there is a committee being formed to do this rate work. So um, there's a question right now of what we push for kind of in this interim period, kind of emergency measures perhaps. Um, and that's really the point of this call. So uh, I just wanna note that and then maybe um, kick back to, uh, to Tim if you have a response for, for Meredith as well or anybody else on the call. 
I'd love to hear what other people have to say. So maybe if you'd like to jump into this conversation, throw something into the chat uh, so Greg can can unmute your mic. Um, you know, just quickly, I would say in response, Meredith, you're you're asking good questions, and you know what I see happening across the nation. There are so many different tools, so many different ways that we can look at the data. Um, I think everybody on this call already knows and agrees that there's that this is something we have to address. Um, but making that case to present to city leaders or to CPS or whoever we need to convince, um, there's so many different ways that we can make that case. I think it's really just a matter of figuring out what's going to be the most effective way that we can present the data, uh, because there are many different ways that. Uh, you know, groups across the nation are, are, are telling this story. And, and, you know, for example, I mentioned Turn from California. Um, you know, they developed a report that is most, it's like half data and half narrative. Like they're, they are literally telling the stories. They, they, they engaged a lot of organizing groups. They gathered um, anecdotes and stories and pictures of people so that as they're presenting kind of their information about what needs to change, it's not just the numbers, but it's also very clearly about you know, human lives. Um, so however we wanna, we wanna do this, I think there are many, many ways. It's, it's, it's kind of a strategic decision that we need to make around uh, where we put our energy, um, what we think will have the most potency as we push on the power structures that are. But I, I welcome other reflections on this. I, I think you're asking a really good question, Meredith, and it needs to be part of, of how, you know, those rate structures and, and looking at historical trauma, light redlining has to be a part of how we work at energy democracy locally. Then I've got up next, um, Russell wanted, he's been uh, tapped into a lot of the uh, response from elected political leaders and, and where that energy, where that conversation has spun out uh, to, uh, which is important to know and that and then informs uh, our ability to organize uh, to meet it. So uh, Russell, you should have a hot mic now. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Gotcha. Okay. Um, first, uh, we have had Another, a crisis before that is similar meltdown of CPS energy management in 2009, 2010 with the uh, fight and battle on the nuke. Um, during that meltdown, uh, a um, committee was formed, investigations happened, and heads rolled. It's the, an investigation committee has been set up by the mayor and I pretty much assume it's by the mayor and a number of people have been appointed to it, including four city council people, a general, some other folks that I'm not familiar with. They will be meeting for the first time Friday uh, at 10 o'clock until noon for two hours every Friday on end until they issue a report. There, uh, this is going to be led by Reed Williams, and I know a lot of folks uh, have uh, feelings about Reed Williams from his um, Vista Ridge involvement. But during the uh, 2010 crisis, he was the one that got us new board members, a search committee that brought us Doyle Benaby and helped things moving in the correct direction. He moved on from that and was doing other things, and but now he is back leading this investigation. It's, I've had a couple of conversations with him already, and I know he's reached out to a, a number of other people within the Sierra Club and other organizations um, to let them know and start spreading the word. The word should be out on the city's website. Ben Gorzell from city staff is gonna be uh, providing the staff uh, report, the websites, uh, the organization of the data in question, and the legwork. Um, three components. One component is they're not going to have traditional citizens to be heard because they're only meeting in these two-hour windows. 
but there's going to be the comment slash impact uh, section. Very important that we document what happened, personal stories of the tragedy that happened. The second uh, box is and bell going off. Is that yours, Russell? I don't think so. Unless we have an artificially limited call duration, I'm not sure. That worries me. That's uh, yeah, that's what it, you got going on. Okay. Um, right. the, sec the second component is going to be um, submitting questions, submitting the questions that they and the community will be asking of the CPS, SAWS, the city, and wherever that may lead. Um, he's been promised not to have limitations on his scope of the investigation on where it goes, that it, and they will try to figure it out. He is not going to wait till the end uh, to issue a report. As they find any answers, data, or anything else of the questions that the community has submitted, they will be putting that up as you go along. In the end, it will be a report issued on the impact, how it was handled, what was right, what was wrong, the whole works. This is our opportunity to all of the things that uh, the impacts that happened because of the institutional nature of, long, of how it impacted neighborhoods and people differently than other parts, getting this in is very important because it will have an impact on the rate structure, on the management, on um, the value of renewables, how each asset performed into technical details. So please watch out for this. Please participate in it. What can please you tell us? Thank, thank you. I'm sorry. What, what can you tell us about? Uh, are there meetings scheduled or how do we direct people? It's something in process that hasn't been released yet. Mon hopefully Monday, uh, Ben Grizzell should have it up on the website. Okay. It's the first event is going to take place in the convention center. I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was a convention center. He told me again, I'm outside listening on the phone as he's telling me this. And they don't know where it's, it's going to be all live, where you can see faces of people and the participants. There's going to be nothing standing behind a telephone like uh, Paula Go Williams and CPS Energy, so you don't even know if the board members are standing there listening to you. Mm -hmm. The public will be able to show up in person on every meeting every Friday between 10 and 2, and they will also be able to uh, participate virtually. Great. Thank, that's a very important update. Thank you for bringing that here uh, to this group and we'll be following up and send out details uh, by email. Uh, I, I wonder if there's other questions for Tim um, as we kind of like cycle deep, deeper into this call. It's uh, 12 after three. Um, and uh, if not, Tim, do you have anything that you would like to, to add that you, we haven't gotten to? I guess the thing that I'm wondering, knowing that, you know, at that initial poll, 55% of the group wanted to go deeper into uh, energy democracy and energy justice. I offered some initial thoughts, um, some framing around that. And, um, you know, the recommendation that I see as a starting point for beginning to tackle that often directs, you know, movement toward emphasizing energy efficiency. So I guess my question is, um, why would we, you know, is there any reason why we wouldn't focus on energy efficiency as a part of that energy justice framework and emphasizing that locally? Um, and maybe also what do we see as the barriers and challenges to advancing that as a, a major, you know, part of our agenda moving forward? I'm, I, I'm curious what people think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to hear from some others too. Because, I mean, I know for my part, um, you know, I, I put up those the the, the open letter points earlier. Uh, we uh, see uh, Sierra Club, myself, uh, Cyrus, whose name I stole for most of this call, um, and uh, and a consultant out of uh, Massachusetts. 
we actually, it's an interesting, we met with uh, Paula Williams, the CPS CEO and several senior staff for uh, three or four meetings around STEP, the Safer Tomorrow Energy Program, uh, trying to drive bigger, more ambitious goals uh, for energy reduction and to focus those reductions by investing in working the com communities of San Antonio for, for working families, improving the housing stock, reducing bills, helping people stay in their homes, uh, decentralized solar, you know, the things that work, that, that really work at a neighborhood level that, that you were talking about, Tim. Um, and uh, I think uh, we're preparing kind of like some follow-up uh, comments on that. And I'm hoping that some of this we can develop into part of this campaign as we, as we review and renew uh, each of these issues and that, that this would be the call uh, for, for next week. And, and, but, 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 I, but I would love to hear from others who are on the call about that. Uh, and I wanna make sure we make room for Didi to, um, if, you, if you'd like to Didi, speak to, the, uh, the, to what's everything that's happening tomorrow. Are you there, Didi? Okay. There's a, in the chat, um, the role of um, microgrids uh, and national security uh, as part of the value proposition for energy justice. So I feel like kind of went into that a little bit, but I don't know if anybody has anything to, to deepen that conversation here. That may be a follow-up. You know, I happen to know that there's a, um, a conversation that's happening in Kerrville, I want to say. It's either Kerrville or Fredericksburg. I, I get my, my Hill Country Resort towns confused sometimes. But uh, one of those towns is having a conversation about um, about community solar. And, um, and I think it's kind of moving in, in some of the direction that you're asking about Terrence. Um, although I don't know that they're necessarily going as deep as, as the question you're asking. Um, certainly, yes, there are um, opportunities uh, to be explored. And I think on a national level, that is, that is a, a driver from what I can understand. Um, maybe, maybe it doesn't play out in the same way on a local uh, level, but but for sure on a national level. Looks like Didi might be back. Yeah, so yeah, I was just gonna say, Didi, do you want to uh, say a few words, direct folks to the, uh, I guess both meetings that are happening tomorrow that people can uh, be influential? Um, yeah, there's a link, okay. Sure, thank you. Uh, real quick, uh, tomorrow we call CPS Energy will, is going to be having a Facebook Live slash uh, Zoom um, event called the truth about CPS energy and how we can uh, take back our utility. So we're going to um, talk about uh, some of the history of our petition drive, um, where it's uh, where the campaign is uh, currently, and especially after um, our petition drive was was stopped um, through the legal uh, through a legal process by CPS energy, and uh, what we can do to still keep the momentum going to hold our, our utility accountable. I uh, also in the chat session put the um, Zoom link so that you could register. It starts at um, seven o'clock tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I think we've, we we can we can we can cut out a little bit early. Like I said, um, Bokias. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, they took that electric line down and made all those nice scorpions first. Uh, okay. Um, side sidetrack, but. Um, but yeah, like so, 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 uh, so support. Uh, you can get involved uh, deep in uh, the work and the and and the press for energy justice. Joining the this call tomorrow, uh, we will continue to work on uh, developing campaign language and priorities and goals. Uh, and uh, please do share this video out. I'm hoping that through both the the Spanish language and the English, uh, we'll reach more people. I'm really interested in those who have had. Um, been directly impacted uh, by the storm, but also haven't been been doing this work or weren't really aware of CPS or how the utility functions. Um, there's a lot to be done. And um, yeah, I agree. Uh, thank you, Tim, for, for everything that you've brought to this meeting and for those who are able to show up. And, and a lot of this for uh, Leticia, 
who uh, joined us uh, to translate. Um, and yeah, we'll keep moving forward together, Avalante. And um, thanks and much love and respect to, to everyone out there working to keep our, our neighbors, our neighborhoods, our communities safe and empowered.